and a warm welcome. You're joining us here at Hyde Park on Other Derana 24. And tonight we thought of talking about Sri Lanka's ongoing discussions with the IMF and how Sri Lanka can overcome the present crisis. But in collaboration with the region, that is South Asia. Um, I've invited to our studios uh, three panelists who will uh, do justice, I believe, to this topic of Sri Lanka, integrating with South Asia to overcome the crisis and seek lasting, sustainable uh, connectivity and uh, growth for the region. Uh, we have with us World Bank South Asia Director of Regional Integration and Engagement, Cecil Fruman joining us to discuss the topic from the World Bank's point of view. And we also have um, Ambassador Shyam Saran, former Foreign Secretary of India, to talk about India, uh, the region, and how um, uh, geopolitics and Sri Lanka's uh, strategic location will help us move forward. We also have with us a um, private sector representative, but truly a change maker in Sri Lanka, um, Group Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of Hemas Holdings, PLC, Kasturi Chelaraja Wilson, a very warm welcome to you too. Um, let's start off talking about um, the regional situation. I'd like to uh, speak to Ambassador Sham Saran here, especially a former um, Foreign Secretary of India. You were Foreign Secretary, if I'm not mistaken, between year 2004 and uh, six, 2006. 2006. A crucial time here in Sri Lanka, just before war ended back in 2009. But from then to now, uh, we don't see much has changed um, in terms of Sri Lanka's uh, economy growing at the pace that we had expected. Uh, what role do you think India can play here, not just to help Sri Lanka overcome crisis, but also to bring the region together to see collective growth? I would not uh, say that uh, since 2006 and uh, the current uh, period, uh, that uh, we have not seen much change. In fact, uh, I have come to Sri Lanka after a, a considerable gap and I can say that uh, I see a lot of change. And I see a lot of change uh, which also um, involves uh, cooperation between India and, and Sri Lanka. Um, if you see, for example, uh, the kind of um, projects that we have been doing on, say, connectivity between India and Sri Lanka, you know, the restoration of, say, ferry services between uh, Indian ports and uh, also uh, Sri Lankan ports. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at uh, what has been uh, done with respect to some of the infrastructure development in Sri Lanka, I think, yes, you have had a very strong investment from China, but India as well, uh, with regard to some of the infrastructure projects, power projects, mm -hmm. for example. Um, in the port itself, today we were visiting uh, Colombo port and uh, certainly one of the very large cargo terminals is being built uh, through Indian investment. So um, I think uh, we should not be uh, perhaps uh, put in a somewhat pessimistic mood because of the uh, crisis. Uh, I think crises come and go and um, I have no doubt that uh, the fundamentals that uh, Sri Lanka has uh, as a transshipment hub, uh, as a tourist you know, destination uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, island state, which is so strategically located, uh, it has all the assets it needs in order to not only recover, but also to get onto a higher growth path. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, what we have been talking about amongst ourselves the last few days, how regional economic integration can really help uh, not only Sri Lanka, but other countries in South Asia uh, to really, you know, see a, a kind of a realization of the tremendous potential which exists uh, amongst the countries in the region. And uh, I think Sri Lanka is very well placed to take advantage of that. Uh, so I would say um, the good news is that Sri Lanka is, at least as far as we can see, emerging from the crisis situation, getting back to a growth track. And also in that process, uh, India has been, I think, a good partner. Um, you know, assisting Sri Lanka uh, during this crisis period. So I think that has created a better atmosphere in which we can pursue uh, much more expanded cooperation. Uh, so uh, my outlook as far as the future is concerned, I think is quite positive. 
Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to turn to Kasturi here to talk about Sri Lanka's case, really. Our private sector has remained resilient uh, throughout these shocks to the economy, whether it's the Easter attacks, uh, whether it's a prolonged um, a period of lockdown during the COVID pandemic, and then uh, during the economic crisis, queues <coughs> of uh, people waiting for fuel, and then uh, a lot of other issues. But really, uh, should we be looking inward or is this South Asia integration really uh, something that we can benefit from, speaking from a Sri Lankan point of view? Um, so how I'll approach it is firstly that uh, A, this crisis didn't happen overnight. It was a buildup of um, wrong monetary or fiscal policies or both. But what it meant was we were too inward looking as well. And we were quite happy, uh, we are resilient inwardly, happy uh, surviving in this uh, little economy um, with protection. And with protection comes uncompetitiveness. So competition doesn't sometimes matter. Um, to get out of this uh, kind of crisis, you need revenues to increase, trade to increase. And Sri Lanka's economy is not going to give you that trade increase. It has to be your export basket, your way of generating that has to be different products and different markets. So when we looked out, and personally I'll just talk about what I know and what I've done, and hence it's, it's not theory. We've looked around and see where can Sri Lanka play, where can we be competitive? And with how can we be competitive? We should have a right to win there. Um, then when Sri Lanka has, the company would have a right to win. Uh, secondly, when you went around, you have the whole world, but when you slice it and dice it, you have this region. And I found that's such a low hanging fruit. And that's the place we could really have success. It's purely because A, regionally, we are kind of so similar. We've got kind of similar histories. B, we have got, we are all kind of struggling in, other than India on macroeconomic crisis. Um, we've, um, we've got a common culture, and mm -hmm. I, that's the most, uh, while it's different in nuances, but we still are having a strong cult culture embedded in each, other, each of our societies. Um, whether even it's health, you have a huge challenge in terms of access, the way the infra or the infrastructure development. And I found that from Sri Lanka point, when you took our portfolio, we either had a product we could could sell or a capability in terms of design or how we understood consumers and, and the created products. And why I say that is unlike um, other markets, this region and, and consumer businesses, uh, the culture is embedded in how we operate in what we mm -hmm. eat or drink or use on our face. You, la you have um, onion used for some purpose, we use it for cooking, somebody will use it for the hair. Uh, but it's such a cultural thing. Like in Sri Lanka, we use clove for a tooth, and clove guard was a success story because of it. We, we knew we could play, we could win, and the markets were interesting. However, going in there, firstly, we have to figure out how do you access the market. The barriers are high. The same way barriers are high. We want FDIs, but the barriers are high in here. Um, or for, for people to come in here, it's, it's the, the operating environment is different. Then when we even find a way of going in market, say the, the tariff to export is high, you go in market. Ah, capital movement for inflows, for outflows from here, there is a huge issue. When you make money in that country, sending it out here is an issue. So everything takes time and it's a, it's a lot of barriers and constraints in how to operate. But actually when you look at it, if you look at the least integrated region is ours, but the most, the, the region which can have highest growth is ours. And actually, each of us, if you really dice it like a, like a company would do, you're, it's like a portfolio. Each of us have our own strengths. Each of us can compete differently and be attractive to different destinations and capabilities. I don't know why we couldn't, we, we have such walls around us. So I struggled, but I still believe that's the place we would s find growth. We are just finding ways of uh, how do you try to make it work in spite of it. But rem imagine a world if I'd, we didn't have these barriers and, and integration was there. 
I think it would have been easier for Sri Lanka particularly to actually succeed and mm -hmm. come out of this mess faster. Mm -hmm. South Asia least integrated but uh, has the greatest potential. Uh, if you can uh, take a cue from that, Seal, and also share with us uh, um, the South Asia development update towards faster, cleaner growth. I'm looking at the October 2023 um, uh, report and we see uh, you're talking about growth prospects for South Asia higher than elsewhere, slower than pre-pandemic, but also you say fiscal challenges in South Asia, high debt but low revenue. With all that, how do we really uh, progress to achieve a, a, a greater South Asia integration and cooperation? How can countries that are in so much debt really look forward to connecting for regional growth when within our countries we have so much of issues to address? Right. Yeah, that's a great point, and I think it's true. In moments of crisis, there often is a tendency to want to look inward and try to fix the problems inward. But the only way to get out of debt is with greater growth. So countries in the region that have high levels of debt, such as Sri Lanka, need to invest in growth. And we know that growth only comes with exports. And so this trade orientation in Kasturi was referring to the fact that this is a country that became very inward looking. This is a country that actually has had millenniums of experience with trade. It, it, it's always been a, a trading country and it did very well um, in you know 1990s or so. If you look at the situation in 2000, 88, the, the trade to GDP ratio was 88 percent. 20 years later, 2020, it was half of that. Same thing on exports, is about uh, exports to GDP, 40% in 2000, less than half of that 20 years later. So it's a, a country that made a choice to impose import restrictions, import duties, high levels of para-tariffs, para and that resulted in this inward orientation. And so I think the, the looking ahead, it is re that really is the question. What is the, the growth model that Sri Lanka wants to engage in? Mm -hmm. And our view is that export-led growth generates jobs, it generates higher levels of productivity, higher levels of, of innovation, and this is a country that has everything at its disposal to be an engine of exports. As Ambassador was saying, we had the benefit this morning of visiting the port. This is a world-class port. You have excellent infrastructure. So if this country made the choice to really invest in exports, you have a magnificent port at your doorstep, which gives you access to the region first, but also to the rest of the world. And so not only have exports declined over the years, but the export basket it has hardly diversified at all. So it's still very much garments, tea, and a few other products. Um, again, lots and lots of room for innovation, creativity, for um, value addition of agriculture, and also diversifying markets. So again, garments tend to go mostly to, to the EU, but what about the neighborhood? You have an, a huge market on your doorstep, India. Bangladesh, which is growing very, very fast, and its GDP per capita is now higher than that of India. So how do you tap those markets, as Kasturi was saying? These are, are great markets on your doorstep. I'd like to add to that, you know, in the export basket is the, the non merchandise export, which is tourism, which was doing quite well before the multiple crisis that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Again, India is, is the number one um, source of visitors to this country. So how to invest and, and bring tourists back. So those, are, I think, are really the factors that are going to allow Sri Lanka to um, get out of, of the crisis, to grow faster, and then to mobilize resources to overall um, ensure uh, higher levels of, of growth, but also equitable growth and sustainable growth, mm -hmm. right? It's not just growth for the sake of growth, but it's jobs, it's bringing the youth in, it's creating more opportunities for everyone ultimately. Um, Ambassador Saran would have something to add to this, I'm sure. Um, especially India can play a, a pivotal role here in connecting the region. But why do you think, um, why do you think the region is still um, not as integrated as we expect and the region has the potential to do when we have a big neighbor, India, standing right there 
uh, sitting right there in the region. So that is precisely the problem. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> we have uh, what I call in India the challenge of proximity, which is if you have a very large country like India, which has smaller neighbors around it, uh, it is inevitable that there will be some kind of uh, anxiety, uh, a certain degree of uh, you know, diffidence because uh, of this fear of uh, domination. Uh, India has to do a much better job in terms of reassuring its neighbors in, in that respect. Uh, so there are uh, political as well as psychological barriers uh, to really pursue uh, a very ambitious you know, economic integration agenda. But I would also say at this point that thanks to the kind of you know, challenges that all of us are facing, uh, that kind of perception is beginning to change. Uh, that you know, really we should be looking at what opportunities there are uh, in respect to the neighborhood. Uh, so <clears throat> Really, uh, if, you, if you take, say, Nepal, uh, Nepal-India border is entirely open. There is free trade between the uh, two countries. Uh, so I always say that when you want to sell uh, Nepal as an investment destination, uh, you should not be talking about Nepal being a market of, say, 30 million people, but it's a market of 30 million people plus 1.4 billion people next door. You have free access. Why not Sri Lanka? Uh, Sri Lanka can actually, you know, leverage the kind of proximity it has to India. And thanks to number of projects for connectivity that are in place and are being put in place. You know, if we are able to leverage that, then the same argument would apply to Sri Lanka. That if there are countries which want to see Sri Lanka as an investment destination, they need not look at only the smaller market, relatively small market of Sri Lanka, but what it offers in terms of its access mm -hmm. uh, to the whole of South Asia, but particularly India, which is a, maybe it is growing somewhat more modestly than before, but it is still a very large economy and it is expanding at the rate of something like six to seven percent per annum, uh, which is perhaps one of the fastest growing large emerging economies. Uh, so you have scale at next door, uh, which is a great advantage. So why not take, take, take full advantage of that, uh, of that potential? Mm -hmm. uh, Kasturi, you mentioned how within the region there is potential. I won't mention brands, but Hemas has uh, gone into the region and we see that a local conglomerate has, has um, spread its wings in the region, uh, targeting audiences or your clientele customers in the region. We're looking beyond South Asia and sometimes beyond Asia uh, in trying to diversify our markets. But uh, what potential from the private sector do you see, for the private sector do you see here, um, just as your organization has gone uh, regional, South Asia region? So I think the potential is, Therefore, so when you see the brands which have done well, when you see tea which has gone globally, um, apparel, um, your yeah, basket is small, but Sri Lanka still has um, something very unique. The cinnamon we have is the best. The Coca Cola is, I'm not sure, the, is absolutely the best, uh, which is used in lots of herbal mm -hmm. stuff. We know, we understand the high end game of um, some of the technologies. We might be good at design, we, not, we are not good at scale. We look at we good at quality at at, a, at at niche places, but the challenge is again it's not only Sri Lanka having barriers. Every country in the region has its own barriers. So you need to go and set it up there to be relevant and to compete. Um, getting even if you plug into global supply chains, when you get it into that country, you have a tax and tariff. Which is, if it's in market, if for example, if I talk about Sri Lanka, if somebody wants to to play in the local market, you have to set up your factory here. If not, you can't import. The same goes for Bangladesh, for Nepal. Um, India is big enough as an economy, so it's, uh, it, it works that way. In contrast, look at ASEAN. Mm -hmm. You have them borderless, right? Goods can trade zero. It's like one country, but different borders. People movement, now they're moving to financial movement. They were not threatened with each other. They were playing for a bigger prize. And 
the byproduct was that that was having intra-regional trade was very high. And they captured the global technology market is very high there. They manufacture, they sell, they, they, the supply chains have moved to that region because they feel it's easy to move within each other. So like Ambassador Shyam said, it's we need to use work on few one connectivities there, work on a few leverage on certain mm -hmm. um, borderless trade agreements which which can be used, set up here and be be able to kind of move. I, I perf personally feel uh, tea is one, our consumer products on herbals which are very good. Our branding and design is and is amazing. I mean, for us, um, Atlas, our stationary brand, I, I mean, I found that we had a design capability. We can slap it on based on each culture and put it out. We saw success in, in the Middle East with that and in Africa. So, but when it comes to South Asia, where I, we understand consumers better because we already have been there. We need to set up infrastructure. So then the cost of entry becomes humongous versus just moving and starting and building. So I think the base thing is just trust and, and work on a few quick wins of integration. Look at, as, and as a region, the question we, and, and I think all our companies in Sri Lanka can leverage because we don't, we are not second in class in some. The biscuit companies have gone to India. I mean, I think no, sure. Baliban has no. gone to yep. India. Um, but it's very few. Why can't more go? I think the struggle is, unless you find a good partner there, it's because each of us have closed the borders of for others mm -hmm. within the region. It's kind of um, a, a struggle to do it. So I think potential is there because we know how to create brands. We know what manufacturing excellence is in that. And apparel showed your teachers we can learn. Mm -hmm. If we don't know, we <coughs> have the neighbor in terms of India who does high-end manufacturing for the global best for the country. You just lift and shift some, something here. And like, like Ambassador Shyam says, why can't anybody who want to access, wants to access India, because that's going to be the next one of the big economies, mm -hmm. why can't the investment be in Sri Lanka or Nepal or um, to just access it? Because proximity is there. The port is there to give access and connectivity to the world as even a transshipment port. So you don't have issues in terms of in and out of raw materials or cargo, I mean, or any passengers. So I guess. Somebody has to come and connect the dots and bring people to the table. Then actually encourage our businesses, because we have lived in an environment we are happy with the domestic business. Mm -hmm. And why do you want to do more? Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, India's first free trade agreement was mm -hmm. with Sri Lanka. With Sri Lanka, yeah. yes. And, and we are now in uh, negotiating with India to uh, look at a comprehensive agreement. Excellent. We're doing the same with, uh, with China and uh, several other agreements, uh, FTAs, are in discussion with Thailand. We're hoping that there will be some agreement by the end of this month or uh, by um, the, the top of November. But um, before we talk about trade packs, also I'd like to turn to Cecile. From a World Bank point of view, we're talking about energy intensity in South Asia, but uh, Sri Lanka faced an energy crisis and a lot of other uh, countries are talking about not going the Sri Lanka way. When we discuss this, what observations does World Bank have in terms of how we can connect regionally? We see, um, we, we talk about energy within uh, each of our countries and how we can create a, a unified energy grid where power and energy connectivity uh, really uplifts our region. Uh, what is the potential here and what challenges do you really see here? So, like, in all things, when you try to do everything as a single nation, it's very difficult. Um, connecting with others, be it through trade or through electricity um, trade, gives you access to a much larger market. India and Sri Lanka have been talking about interconnecting their grids for decades now. Uh, what we hear is that it seems that it could happen, and it could happen very fast. And there are great, great benefits for Sri Lanka. It's going to give Sri Lanka access to a much larger market um, that enhances uh, energy uh, security. Mm -hmm. It can lower the price, and it also feeds into the conversation that is absolutely on the fore of everyone's mind right now, which is clean energy and renewable energy. Um, Sri Lanka has a lot of clean energy potential, be it in solar, be it in wind. The ability then to export that to India, but also to be importing some of the renewables generated in India. 
But it's not just India. If Sri Lanka can connect to India, then it can connect to the rest of, of the region. India is now already trading with Nepal. Nepal produces hydropower. That's a very clean and cheap source of energy, which is very beneficial for countries like India and Bangladesh in particular that have very little access to their own renewable mm -hmm. energy. So that's really the potential. The potential is over time to integrate all of these grids and to integrate the generation and the transmission. Because what we see in other parts of the world is that when you do that, you're going to enhance your, your access and security. You're going to make um, your service much more reliable so you don't have blackouts or you don't have moments where, where your consumers can't have reliable electricity. You're going to get a better price point and overall you're going to improve the, um, you're going to green, green your energy mix. And that I think is absolutely essential for growth in the future. Uh, I open question to the panelists here. We're talking about uh, climate change and Sri Lanka also heavily discusses sustainability climate change. How can the private sector again contribute to this? World Bank, what do you think is, is a potential for Sri Lanka and India's leading role here? I'm not going to waste time asking individual questions, but I'm sure with your expertise, Ambassador Shyam Saran has played a pivotal role in talking about sustainability, in contributing. So how do we gel this together? So this is one of the very important uh, subjects that uh, in fact uh, where you know, not only India but other South Asian countries uh, have been working together with the World Bank on something called an ecology uh, integrity initiative uh, which is really to look at all various aspects of the climate change challenge. Uh, so, uh, if we, if we uh, look at it from the uh, Sri Lankan perspective, it has a certain very um, specific challenges because it is an island nation. If, for example, you know, as a result of climate change, sea levels rise, mm -hmm. that is going to be uh, maybe even an existential problem uh, for island countries like uh, Sri Lanka. Um, all of us are impacted by the changes that are taking place, for example, in the monsoons. You know, um, we are having much larger rainfall within shorter periods of time, and that is making a big impact. Um, we have, uh, you know, melting of the glaciers in the north. Uh, and all these are really challenges which none of the countries in South Asia no matter how powerful, for example, a country that India is, cannot deal with these problems on its own. Mm -hmm. So unless we work together with other countries in South Asia, uh, there is going to be a suboptimal kind of a response mm -hmm. uh, to the challenge of climate change. Uh, so one of the things that needs to be done is this message needs to be constantly drummed into people's minds. Mm -hmm. Our leaders have to understand that. That is not enough to really make declarations about working together, but you really need down to get down to the ground and really do something uh, about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are at a, in a sense, you know, the crisis which say Sri Lanka is facing or some of the other countries in South Asia are facing, including India. India is not immune to this. Uh, I think this is a time where such a message perhaps can have greater resonance than it normally has. Uh, so this is something which uh, has to be really today at the top of the agenda, regional agenda. Otherwise, I think we are going to be facing a very existential challenge all around the mm -hmm. region. I mean, even when we talk about this, the emphasis on South Asia is greater as we discussed today. Same question on sustainability and private sector role. But again, in Sri Lanka, one may wonder why are we talking about South Asia so much more than ever? Uh, ha ha has, there, has this potential ever been the same or is it just important now because of our geographical location? So from a sustainability and climate mm -hmm. particularly, we, we firstly, we took it on as a ticking, ticking a box, right? Uh, we, we, don't, we didn't feel it, but now, and we are citizens, citizens come into a corporate. We realize it's something real. We see here, we've got our weather patterns are so different. We've got the people, the floods this time was way off. Suddenly the temperatures, we've never been in Sri Lanka having temperatures at 20, 21 degrees. And it's not what we're doing here alone. 
it's something to do with the region. Mm -hmm. So we can't say climate is something I control alone today, whether I plant one tree or ten, destroy ten trees. It has an impact to me as well as it impa has my impact to a neighbor. So it's like a community. You can't be selfish saying, I can survive on my own. I can't. If I get a cold or an infectious disease, I'll either, com I would like the pandemic. I'll, I'll infect everybody or everybody helps each other to be safe around it. So if, if there is, it's the waterways we share, the plastic we pollute in any country in the region. And why I say region is that's proximity. The climate first comes from proximity and it moves out. Mm -hmm. And more I travel in the region, I realize every country is having weather dis patterns which have changed. Every co country has a disaster. And it's common. And there's something we're doing to e each of our countries and we're doing for other countries as well as damage. If we don't take it as a topic which is imperative for the region as well as the world, I guess we are all going to have to be accountable for the people and how many the people, homes, lives, um, economies itself. Uh, if you talk about this from a profits point of view for corporates, how would you address this? Your best place to talk about it? Yeah, because look, if the economy doesn't survive, if people don't survive, uh, if the planet doesn't survive, the company is not in existence today. I know we use a lot of plastics as organization, but the, region, the world uses it. We have to figure out how do we collect it and move it out of the system. We take pleasure in destroying trees. The impact of a flood, I lose revenue. Every, every day it costs me uh, revenue because you cannot serve the customer. The customer loses a daily wage. And you're not talking about corporates alone, right? Mass, the 80% of our customers are the daily wage people or the people who work in SMEs, and uh, we are going to struggle on that. So if you don't solve co uh, the climate, can't the, customer, the companies would struggle purely because the customers are struggling. And eventually, if it destroys lands, I mean, you destroy one third, as you say, Sri Lanka is an island. One third goes down. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? It's, it, it, the disaster is too much even to quantify. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I guess we also have a moral thing of our kids. Forget the country. You just think of your generation of kids. You have kids who want to live in this planet, right? You want to give them something to live. You would want to see, just because you die, you don't want your kids to suffer. Why don't we even look at it at that lens? You can't say it's going to go away. You, can, you can't say, I'm going to damage all the trees, block all the waterways, and I'm, we are all going to be OK. Then there is no point having this conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly. Uh, Cecile, you'll have something to add again on the topic of climate change and sustainability um, from a World Bank perspective here. I think what this conversation illustrates is this notion of interdependence, right? So interdependence of landscapes, of rivers, of um, yeah. oceans and air sheds also, right? I mean, yeah. that we've done some recent analysis that shows that this is a region that suffers from air pollution, probably less so in Sri Lanka than in northern, northern India or, or Nepal, Bangladesh, and, and uh, Pakistan. But these con countries are very much interdependent. And so our point is that, and I think it's Kasturi's point also, no one can solve this alone. Therefore, there's an imperative to work together, and that means shared solutions, but also pooling resources, pooling knowledge, pooling data. And that, I think, is particularly relevant for some smaller economies such as Sri Lanka. So let's take Hydromet, for instance. So hydrology, meteorology. You want to have adequate early warning systems. You want to be able to predict floods and to give people warning so that they're not in harm's way, that they can um, move their families, their livestock, and, and get out as fast as possible. That is actually a science that is inherently complex and quite expensive. So to expect that every small country in South Asia will have uh, the full complement of scientists and uh, technology is a tall order. But by bringing these countries together, by pooling data, by doing some modeling together, by putting resources together, you can get much, much better outcomes. So those are the kinds of solutions that we are trying to encourage. Um, on air pollution, these have to be negotiated solutions. You need countries that might not voluntarily want to work together to actually agree on some common objectives and some common actions. Mm -hmm. So it's not always easy, but what we notice in this region is that when the imperative is well understood, when it becomes really an exi existential crisis, as many have said, 
um, there is much greater willingness to collaborate, mostly at the scientific level. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're, we're supporting. Do we have uh, companies in Sri Lanka who are focusing more on green jobs, creating uh, sustainable uh, working environments? I think you do have, um, particularly either they are forced on, I think three baskets is, um, they are part of global organizations uh, like the banks who are forced to do it and then they have best in class of what, how to transform into that and they kind of practice it. Second basket is you have people who are plugged into global value to customers and part of being on the part of the value chain in, makes it imperative that we do it and like apparel. But over time, those customers have made it a way of life. Then understand the impact. You know, initially you start saying because you're forced to, mm -hmm. later on you understand that impact. Third basket is the locals who actually want our planet and want our country to be at a better place. We want to leave it at a better place than what we took it over. Mm -hmm. So you have that, but is it enough? No, I mean, it might constitute of a very small percentage of uh, people who control or damage or have influence over the environment. Um, so like Cecile said, I guess while acknowledging it, you need experts, you need people who can make decisions on this to be brought together. And it has to be collectively done. Um, and private sector has to take its share of the uh, responsibility on executing and influencing mm -hmm. the change. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Sham Saran, um, I'd also like to talk, we have just about uh, less than 10 minutes to go, but um, to discuss how we can really think about Pakistan also when we talk about integrating the region. Uh, I think, again, uh, you would be able to talk about this uh, from a foreign secretary of India, and you observe very closely the developments here. Um, we cannot forget about Pakistan when we talk about the region and integration cooperation. How can we really look at politics aside, diplomatic affairs aside, economics and integrating um, the rest of South Asia, but bringing Pakistan to be uh, an integral part of this region as it is. This is my personal mm -hmm. view, so <laughs> I am not expressing uh, a government of India view, but uh, I have no doubt in my mind that if we are talking about South Asia integration, uh, it cannot be without the participation of Pakistan. Uh, or for that matter, the participation of Afghanistan as well, which is the eighth member country of uh, SARC. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can't get away from the political barriers which today exist uh, between India and Pakistan. But I also take uh, some heart from the fact that we have also had periods where actually we have been able to overcome some of those political barriers and at least begin the task of you know reconnecting between India and Pakistan. Uh, so even today, for example, you have a Kartarpur corridor, which allows you know the free movement of uh, pilgrims uh, from India to Pakistan. Um, some of the uh, transport corridors which were established during the time that, for example, I was foreign secretary, uh, some of those are still working. You know, uh, so uh, I think uh, that gives me the sense that. Uh, you know, once the political environment changes, you can actually pick up mm -hmm. uh, much of the uh, sort of uh, cooperative uh, level of activities that we have had uh, in, in, the, in the past. By the way, even though the official trade between India and Pakistan may be, may be somewhat modest, but the informal trade uh, between the two countries, whether it is through you know, Dubai or whether it is through Singapore, is uh, actually quite large. So if you could actually turn that trade uh, to direct trade between India and Pakistan, uh, both countries would benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are areas which have already been identified where the two countries through cooperation could actually have more benefit for each other. And once the political situation improves, which I hope will, uh, in the in the near future, uh, I think many of these things can be uh, picked up uh, again. Uh, I do uh, believe that uh, you know uh, South Asia is one single geopolitical unit, which is today divided into mm -hmm. separate independent nations. But it is one single economic unit with great complementarities amongst different regions of South Asia. And secondly, 
as we were talking about earlier about climate change and ecology, this is one single ecological unit. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that unity uh, that exists in this uh, region. Mm -hmm. um, and that is both the strength as well as if we don't pay enough attention, that could become uh, a challenge. Uh, by the way, if you give me two minutes, I would like to just mention the fact <coughs> that uh, you know our visit to the port this morning. I was surprised to see that uh, you know about 85% of the transit trade, which is handled by this port, is India-related. You know, um, uh, traffic. Um, to me, it seemed as if this was a classic example of how regional integration actually is working. Because this is transit which both benefits India as well as benefits Sri Lanka. There is a huge expansion of the infrastructure which is taking place in the port. So even if perhaps in other areas of Sri Lanka's economy, there may be somewhat less uh, of an of a optimist sort of outlook, here certainly seems to be very, very optimistic mm -hmm. because there is very ambitious you know, expansion plans which are there and all related to the continuance of this port as a very important transit port, not only for India, but say for Bangladesh and maybe for other South Asian countries as well. Mm -hmm. So why not learn from that example? Um, I think uh, the, f the final two questions again. Uh, Cecile, you might have something to add to uh, Ambassador uh, Saran's observation, but at the same time, if you talk about some of the key factors or key indicators from uh, World Bank research and how we can address these challenges. Kasturi spoke about barriers to trade, and we've been discussing how tourism and how uh, how, how the visa process can be uh, uh, fast-tracked so that we can see more people-to-people -people connectivity in the region. But again, um, what really needs to be done in the immediate term to address these challenges? So we spoke a lot about trade and it's very important because it is an engine of growth and as Kasturi said it's a shared responsibility so there are some some policies that uh, need to evolve here in Sri Lanka but equally in the rest of the region. This is a region that um, has opened up to the rest of the world much faster than it has to its neighborhood. Um, a striking figure is that an Indian, for an Indian firm to export to Germany or Brazil it's much cheaper than actually exporting to their neighbor in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And that's because we have this concept of thick borders. It's very hard to get through the borders. Now, Sri Lanka is in a very favorable position because as you said, actually, it has amazing connectivity through the port, through the shipping lanes. Um, there are still some, some tariffs, some non-tariff barriers, but these are, can absolutely be addressed. And I think it is about having a more forward-looking trade policy um, and negotiating that through these, these free trade agreements. So I think that's a very positive momentum, something we would expect to see further. Mm -hmm. There are also new opportunities for collaboration. Right? We talked a lot about climate and this imperative to collaborate. Another topic that I'd like to bring up is pandemic preparedness and response, right? I think we've all been scarred by COVID. We've seen how disruptive it has been to the economy, but also to our personal lives and, and loss of lives. And unfortunately, there will be another pandemic around the corner. We are not immune to this. Um, I think it is a risk that we live with. Now, this is the only region that does not have a concerted regional effort. There's no regional institution and there's no dialogue around this. Yet without sharing data, without being open and candid on what's happening, without having shared um, uh, laboratories, shared uh, research centers, again, the burden on the smaller countries is extremely high. Mm -hmm. So this is another area where we're supporting uh, more regional collaboration because not only can it lead to to saving lives, but we also think that it can lead to much better responses than we've seen in, in the past. Um, Kasturi, for your closing remarks here, um, again, maybe from the private sector again, how do you think Sri Lanka's private sector could benefit A and B, what, um, what immediate um, responses should the government uh, adhere to or take to, to change this situation and address the question of integrating with the region to benefit our economy? Um, so ob obviously the, the private sector's um, low-hanging fruit is 
going into an, into a, into the region which is you understand it better you understand the consumer better but you need to figure out how we can work together to understand how we can bring these thick borders down but there is another opportunity i think um, previously the world moved towards manufacturing sites based on cost the pandemic taught supply chain cannot be only on cost it has to be in 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 accessibility and and uh, you have to have options as well and the region plays that be it india bangladesh sri lanka we can even play sri lanka can play the connectivity part of it uh, india can be the option 2 or bangladesh can be option option 2 for manufacturing but i think in this china plus 1 and and when the world is moving on looking at different uh, manufacturing sites it doesn't have to be in offshore and or near shore it can be in between where you have the we have access to the raw material the capability and the connectivity and i think south asia is the best place for that so that's another point where um, the private sector should push governments to work on this so typically you have to choose one or two and try doing small things to unlock value if you see success people will start believing it remember this is you're talking about a region and and which has not integrated which has gone whether it's political or biases we have as citizens we need to eliminate and there are good stories if you look at the, the road network connect between nepal bangladesh and, and india i mean it took long but we did that the power sharing so those stories it doesn't harm nobody is going to be harmed because that that thing has to be taken off i think these two elements if we can focus on the trade as well as being part of a supply chain solution for the world as south asia i think those are two areas we should focus on thank you very much for your time i believe although this is a broader question we were able to address most of our concerns tonight at hyde park uh, i'd like to thank kasturi chelaraja wilson uh, group chief executive officer and uh, um, executive director of hemas holdings for joining us tonight kasturi is also an active member of several industry um, associations and currently serves on the main board of the ceylon chamber of commerce was a uh, president of the sri lanka chamber of pharmaceutical industry and has been recognized by several uh, organizations for being a change maker uh, a woman leader in the country um, thank you very much for your contribution um i would also like to thank ambassador shyam saran former um foreign secretary of india who's currently visiting in sri lanka um and uh, he was also uh former prime minister's special envoy on nuclear affairs and climate change in india and after leaving the government uh, service in 2010 ambassador saran has served in several think tanks and also contributed um uh, as the president of the india international center um and has authored two books how india sees the world and how china sees india and the world i look forward to reading your books ambassador um i'd also like to thank cecil fruman world bank south asia director of regional integration and engagement cecil is responsible <coughs> for fostering collaborative activities amongst sa countries and managing partnerships and engagement with sa and global development partners sa south asia region if i'm not mistaken thank you very much once again uh, for your expertise and for your time here at hyde park We'll see you again next week at the same time with yet another discussion until then take care have a pleasant evening good night